Hello, welcome to 6.2 Volumes. All right, this gets a little bit wild and crazy here. We are now taking a function f of x. We've already talked about the area under the curve f of x. What we're ha what's happening now is we're taking this area, this two-dimensional slab here, and we're going to rotate it for now about the x-axis, and we're gonna create this solid. So if we were to take this and start spinning this around the x-axis, thinking in our a third dimension, um, we are now creating a solid that has volume. So how do we find the volume of a solid of revolution? All right, bear with me. Remember, back from chapter seven or back from our calculus days, in order to calculate this area, we used rectangles. It doesn't matter how exactly we're gonna use a rectangle, but we call the width of the rectangle delta x, right? And the height of the rectangle is determined by some value in this interval of the base of the rectangle, right? And we would find the height of the rectangle by using the function for some point in between here. And it really doesn't matter what we use because delta x is gonna shrink down to zero and as we take the limit as delta x goes to zero, that's going to converge on the area under the curve. So now imagine spinning this rectangle right here. Well, if we spin this rectangle, right, we're gonna spin that rectangle. And when we spin a rectangle, it becomes a disc. So how we're gonna estimate or calculate the area of this solid we're gonna look at these disks. So let's pull this disk out right here, right here. So let's just look at a, let's look at a disk in general or a cylinder. Let's just suppose we have a cylinder, right? And we usually talk about the height and the radius and the volume of a disk or a cylinder is equal to pi r squared times the height, right? So that's what we have here, just turned on its side. So if we look at this guy right here, I'm gonna pull this guy out right here, and we have, sorry, I'm really bad at drawing. We have this right here. Right? So the height, I'm just flipping that guy on its side, so H is gonna get replaced with delta X, and the radius is going to be the function at some point inside there. So the volume, here is equal to pi, and instead of r squared, it's gonna be f of x star squared, and then the height is delta x. So now what we're going to do is let delta x go to zero, and we're gonna calculate an infinite collection of these disks in order to obtain the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the function f of x about in this case, the x-axis. Right. So putting this all together, and as delta x goes to zero, or in f of x is, um, determines the height, we get the volume to be integral from a to b pi f of x squared dx. Not sure if we've talked about the corny cloud yet, but my corny cloud, especially if it has stars, means it's really super important. All right, so let's apply this. Let's find the volume of the solid obtained by resolving the function f of x equals five, super simple function, about the x-axis between two and 11. So here's my function f of x equals five. All right, we're going between two and 11. So we're taking this, we're spinning it about the x-axis, and ah, can you imagine what the shape is gonna be? It's literally gonna come out, so it's gonna go down to negative five, it's going to come out to be a tin can, a cylinder. Right. And we already know the volume of a cylinder, but let's do this using this template. The volume is going to be, we're gonna go from two to 11, pi, the function f of x is just five, five squared dx, right? So we're going from two to 11, 25 pi dx, which is 25 pi x 
from 2 to 11. Stick in the upper and lower limits. And we get 225 pi. So now notice this is just a cylinder of height 9 and radius 5. So if we were to do this using geometry, if we have a cylinder of height 9 and radius 5, the volume would be, well, it's pi r squared times the height, which would be pi 25 times 9, which is 225 pi. All right, well, why do we need this template? Well, not all functions are constant functions. This allows us to rotate any function and determine the volume obtained from the solid. All right, so let's look at this guy. Let's find the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the function x squared between negative 1 and 3. So I kind of, it's a little uh, uh, spread out just so I can see the function better. So what we're doing is we're taking this solid bet between negative one and three. Sorry, my cats are fighting. So if you hear some horrible noises, I apologize. So we're taking this guy and we're spinning it about the x-axis. So imagine spinning that guy about the x-axis. What's the shape going to be? Well, it's going to be just a mirror image down here. It's going to look kind of like this. That it's all that important, but it's sort of, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if that's quite an hourglass shape, all right? It's going to look like this, all right, like that, and we're looking for this solid, right, and we're looking for the volume of this guy, all right? So we have this great template. The volume is equal to, now I'm going to pull the pi out front because it's just a constant, so I can pull it out front. We're going to go from negative 1 to 3, and the function is x squared. So it's x squared. Don't forget to square it because it's pi r squared, and the radius is determined at any point in time here. If we look at one little disk in here, the radius is determined by the value of the function at that point, dx. So this is just pi, negative 1 to 3, x to the fourth dx pi times one-fifth x to the fifth between negative one and three. And remember, WebAssign prefers, and I also prefer, that you use exact values. So let's leave this as, whoops, sorry, 244 pi over five. I don't want the decimal. I want the exact value. All right. All right, let's try another one. Let's look at the function f of x equals the square root of x by revolving f of x equals about the square root of x about the x-axis between 0 and 9. So here's 9 right here. And so here's my function. We're going to spin that around at 9. We're at 3, so it's going to go down to like negative 3. It's going to look something like this. So this is the solid we're looking for. So the volume is going to be pi. We're going between 0 and 9. That was handed to us. The square root of x is my function. We're going to square it. dx. All right. So this is pi. The square root of x squared is just x. Right. So it is pi, one-half x squared, between 0 and 9. So it's going to be 81 pi all over 2. That would be the volume of this sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, sort of. It's a bowl, but it's really not. Whatever shape you want to call it. All right, ready? It's not too bad. A little crazy here. We are now going to take the same function, square root of x, and I'm going to spin it about the y-axis instead. So if I spin it about the y-axis, it's now going to look like this, right, on that side. And we're going to have, well, we can have two shapes. We can either have this under here, right? So are we looking here or am I looking up here? Well, it tells me that I'm going between 
x equals, so that find the value of solid obtained by revolving the area bounded by the square root of x. So this is my square root of x. So we want to make sure we read the details. y equals 3. So here's y equals 3. And x equals 0. So this is what we're spinning. So the x equals 0 is the y-axis. So when we spin this, we're going to get something like this. All right, now this is clearly different. We're now spinning it around the y-axis. So things are a little different. So if we think about just this shape right here, right, we can find this by, and if we're spinning around the y-axis, it's important to think of it this way. We're gonna go right to left. So this function, y equals square root of x is equivalent to y squared equals x. Now it's okay to square both sides, funky things don't happen, but when you go in reverse, funky things could happen. So now, if I imagine I'm integrating this way and I'm thinking of these like sort of horizontal hockey pucks instead, one of these disks, well, this is gonna be delta y, so I'm gonna integrate with respect to y, and the radius of one of the pucks now depends on the value of y. So the volume is going to be, so if I spin around the y-axis or I spin any time I spin vertically like this, we're now going to integrate with respect to y. So now it's going to be pi. My function is y squared. My integration variable is y, y squared, dy. And if I'm going, I need to know this point of intersection right here. It's where y equals 3. So this is the point 9, and that was the point 3. And it goes down here, so from 0 to 3. So I'm now spinning the square, y equals the square root of x, which is equivalent to spinning x equals y squared about the y-axis. If you spin something about the y-axis, you integrate with respect to y as of now. If you integrate, if you're spinning about the x-axis, you're going to integrate with respect to x. So this was given as a function of y is a function of x, so I had to turn it into x is a function of y, so I could integrate with respect to y. So pi... 0 to 3, y to the 4th, dy. So this is going to be pi times 1 fifth, y to the 5th, 0 to 3. Right? And then it's going to be 243 pi's over 5. So stay with the exact values, okay? All right, so that being said, if we have a function x can be expressed as a function of y, and we're spinning it about the y-axis. Okay. We're going to now look at horizontal rectangles. The width of the rectangle is delta y. The height is f of y. And the volume is going to be pi c to d, f of y, the radius is now defined by f of y squared dy. Okay. So let's try a couple more. Now my two previous examples behaved nicely. In the previous two examples, the area was flush up against the axis of revolution. Not always the case. Let's consider the area bounded by the square root of x in the line y equals x. So we know that this area is, well, what is this area? So I'm not looking for volume right now, I'm just looking for area. So it's going to be, you can see that my integration limits go from 0 to 1. You can plug them in and see that's right. It's going to be the top function minus the bottom function, right? And we get it to be... One sixth. All right, so that's just a practice from 6.1. Now let's suppose we take this and we spin it about the x-axis. So I'm spinning this area about the x-axis. Now notice that when I spin this about the x-axis, it's going to look like this. Let's see if I can get a good drawing in here for you. Right, so if I start spinning it, it's going to look something like this. 
right now I can't shade in the whole thing. So if we spin it, this is gonna be all solid on the outside, but we're gonna be empty on the inside. So to find this volume, what we would do is find the outer volume right here, and then subtract this emptiness right in here, created by that cone inside there. So we're gonna subtract that, right? So this volume is going to be pi. We're still just going from zero to one, right? We're revolving about the x-axis. So we're gonna integrate with respect to x, x goes from zero to one. So if I was just spinning the square root of x, I would have the square root of x squared and then I'm gonna subtract from that, that hollow area created by this cone shape, which is going to be defined by the function x squared dx. Now we square it because it is f of x squared. Now I'm gonna condense this. Notice that this is just the same as pi zero to one square root of x minus x squared dx. Now you may think of that as top minus bottom, but I'm gonna change the vocabulary a little bit here. Whoa, be careful, I lost that squared here. Don't lose that squared. All right, so this is going to be, this is what I call my outer function. And this is my inner function because what I did is I took the outer shape I took that entire volume from this integral right here and then I subtracted the inner cone the one that's missing that makes that hollowness in the middle so outer function minus inner function another way to look at this to determine what is the outer function and what is the inner function I always draw a line from my axis of revolution to each of the functions so there's that one Now the longer one is going to give me the outside of my shape and the shorter one is gonna give me the inside. So it's always the outer minus the inner. I mean, if I did the inner minus the outer, I'd get negative volume, which doesn't make sense. So I started at my axis of revolution and I drew a vertical line to the outer function and to the inner function. The shorter one is the inner and the outer longer one is the outside. So now we're just gonna do the math here. I ran out of room a little bit. Don't forget to square it, because I did, and you don't wanna do that, because you will get the wrong answer. So we're gonna get pi zero to one, x squared. Nope, it's just x. Oh my goodness, don't look at that. Try this again. Pi zero to one, the square root of x squared is just x, minus x squared dx, right? Which is pi one half x squared minus one third x cubed from zero to one pi one half minus one third three six minus two six pi over six All right. pi over six now volume like area between curves should always be positive all right so outer minus inner. Keep that in mind. Let's take my functions, y equals the square root of x and y equals x, and now let's revolve it around the y-axis. Right, so if I spin this about the y-axis, it's going to look like this over here. Right? And it's going to have something like, like a shape like this, right? So now my outer shape is the pointy cone. And the inner shape, which is missing, is going to be the arched cone. So now we want to do outer minus inner. But notice this time we are spinning about the y-axis. And when we rotate around the y-axis, we want to integrate with respect to y. So I wanna change this, now y equals x, there's nothing I have to do here, but this is equivalent to y squared equals x. 
I want to integrate I'm now thinking of my rectangles like this horizontal this is going to be delta y okay the difference between this and what was going on previously is my rectangle extended all the way to the y-axis but now I have this gap so if we are finding volumes and we're spinning about the y-axis we are going to integrate with respect to y so this volume is going to be pi I can see that my integration limits y goes from 0 to 1. Now, it's just a coincidence that x and y both go from 0 to 1. So we'll, more difficult problems, we will have to figure out those bounds. And it's going to be my outer function. So I go from my axis of revolution to the outer curve. And I go from my axis of revolution to my inner curve. So my outer curve is this. So it's going to be my outer curve squared minus my inner curve squared, all in terms of y. So this volume is going to be obtained by taking this length of this line, which is based on the value of y and squaring it. So r squared would be y squared. This is x equals y squared, and we're going to square that, and we get y squared squared. Pi zero to one, y squared minus y to the fourth, dy. So this is my outer function, outer function squared, inner function, always outer minus inner. And then you're going to do this and you're going to get 2 pi over 15. Okay, so do the details, put in the details. All right, so hopefully that's making some sense. All right, let's look at this. All right. This time I'm taking the same shape. It's a little distorted. So I have the function y equals the square root of x. And I have the function y equals x. And this is the area bounded, this little one sixth. Right, and I'm spinning it. This time I'm spinning it horizontally again, but I'm spinning it about the line y equals negative two. So I'm spinning it about this line. So this is what it's going to look like. So I have sort of an open top and open bottom shape now. Right, so how do we do this? Well, if you go along the lines with the outer minus the inner, I always go with my original functions. This is just the mirror image down here so we can see the shape. But if I didn't have, if I hadn't done this yet, I'm going to go from the axis of revolution to the outer curve right here, and the axis of revolution to the inner curve. So the shorter line is the inner, the longer line is the outer. So now here's where things get a little bit tricky because we have this little added gap here. We have to take that into consideration. So the length of the outer line is, well, what would be the length of this? Like, right, what would be the length from here to here? Well, if I was at, if I was all the way over here, the length would be negative 2 to 0. This would have the length 2. If I was over here, where this was the point x equals 1, and we went to 1, 1, and this was negative 2 to 1, this would be 3. So the length at any point is the top value minus the bottom value. So we've got to be careful here. We're going to do, we have outer minus inner squared, right? So I'm going to say outer radius because we're doing disks here. So it's outer radius minus inner radius. Right? So the outer radius is determined by top minus bottom. And the inner radius is also top minus bottom. All right, so bear with me while I set this up. So this volume is going to be, we're spinning 
horizontally, so it's like spinning along the line y equals zero to the x-axis, but we're just dropping it down here, creating a larger shape. Our x's still go from zero to one. Okay, so now my outer radius is the top, which is the square root of x, minus the bottom, which is negative two. So this is top minus bottom, and the outer radius would be the square root of x plus two, and we're squaring that. Minus, now we're gonna do the inner line. The inner line is top minus bottom, so the top is the function y equals x minus the bottom, negative two, and we're squaring that. And that's all with respect to x. Woo! So this just becomes pi, zero to one, x plus, square root of x plus two squared, minus x plus two squared dx. All right, and I'm gonna, not gonna spend the 20 minutes to do that integral. <coughs> So what we did here is what we called um, washers and disks. Back here, if we flip through, whoops, back here, when we looked at, let me get that page back, sorry, I should have set this back here. Right here we were doing disks because when our, when our area is flush up against the axis of revolution, we're going to, we're using these like disks right? and we're taking an infinite collection of those disks. But then when we have a gap where our area is not flush up against the axis of revolution, we're taking this and we're spinning this. So we call this washers. All right, so you're gonna kind of get like, imagine like a little washer shape. That's a really bad washer, like a ring. So it's the outer and then we take out the inner circle. So let's just see if we can generalize that here for you. So typically we're given two functions. We're given this function here, and we're given this guy here, and they're bounded between some points A and B, and we're spinning it about, in this case, the axis of revolution. So we're going to, I always go from my axis of revolution to the, out, to the outer curve, right there. And that's going to create a volume if we were to just spin the orange curve, but then we have to take out this gap right here. That's not part of this area, that piece. So the volume of one of these rings is going to be the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared times pi. So the volume is pi I'm going to do outer radius squared minus inner radius squared. And we integrate with respect to x if we're spinning horizontally. So integration with respect to x, right? and then we go from a to b. Right? If we are going left to right, we have a curve on a clearly defined right curve and a clearly defined left curve. I do the whole axis of revolution to each of the curves. And the volume, the integration variable, integrate with respect to y if we're spinning vertically, and the volume is still pi, I guess this goes from a to b, outer, outer radius squared minus inner squared with respect to y. Now we want to be really careful when we're doing if we're not spinning along an axis because we have to take that added distance 
into consideration. All right, so I'm going to give you an example here. We're not going to evaluate, let's see, any of the integrals, but we're going to set them up. So let's go through this. I'm going to look at six different scenarios. y equals x minus 3 squared and y equals 2x minus 6. So let's see, this is clearly the linear function, right? y equals 2x minus 6. The green is this guy right here, and that's y equals x minus 3 squared. We're going to spin it about the x-axis. We're going to spin it about the line y equals 5. We're going to spin it about the line y equals negative 3. And then the y-axis and two other values of x. So I did this on each individual pages. So let's find the volume obtained by revolving this area about the y-axis. So here is y equals 2x minus 6, x minus 3 squared. Right, so we're going to be spinning it down here like this. Right, like this, and it's going to look at some shape like this. And so we have that little gap in there. So I go from my axis of revolution to the outermost function. So that's my outer one is y equals 2x minus 6. My inner one is the parabola. Okay, so the volume is going to be pi. Whoops, did we determine where these intersect? Ah, I gotta find the points of intersection. Let's see if it's obvious from here. If I put in, my guess is it's x, x equals three and five maybe. Let's see if that works. I'm just gonna check. So five minus three is two, so four. And then if I put five in here, I get 10 minus six, which is four. So it's definitely at five. If I put three in there, I get zero and zero. Okay, so I know x goes from three to five. So I'm going to integrate from 3 to 5, right? So now I'm integrating um, it with three, uh, spinning about the x-axis. So it's going to be my outer radius. So it's 2x minus 6 squared minus my inner radius, which is x minus 3 squared squared dx. We're going to go with red anyway. So sorry, that got a little, I'll try to be better with this guy. All right, so we took this shaded area right here between the function y equals 2x minus 6 and x minus 3. 2x minus 6 to the x-axis is a larger distance than x minus 3 squared. So it's the outer minus the inner. Let's do it again. Now we're going to do this and we're going to integrate this about, we're going to spin it now along this line. So we're going to take this shape right here and spin it along this line. All right, so now here's where things get a little fun, okay? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from my axis of revolution to my outer function. That's going to be my longer one. If my axis of revolution to my inner one, right? All right, now it's going to be the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared. So the length of this line right here, the top of it is at five and the bottom of it is at x minus, so remember this is x minus three squared. And this is the line y equals two x minus six. Right, so it's the outer radius squared So the outer radius is the length of this. Now the outer radius is the top minus the bottom. So the top is five and the bottom is the parabola x minus three squared. That's the length of this line. The inner radius is equal to top. It's always top minus bottom. So the top is going to be five minus 2x minus 6. Be careful, make sure you include parentheses there. 
So the volume is going to be pi. We already know we go from, we determined it goes from three to five. It's gonna be the outer radius squared. That's the outer radius. There's a squared in there, squared. Minus the inner radius. And we're gonna integrate with respect to x. So anytime we spin around a horizontal line, we're integrating with respect to x. So this time our, inter our, our axis of um, rotation was above the shape. So it was the axis of rotation minus the bottom shape, axis of rotation minus the closer shape. Okay, so why am I doing that? Well, let's look at this guy. Let's spin this again. But this time I'm spinning it about the line y equals negative three. So I'm gonna go from my axis of rotation to the further away curve, which this time is the line, and my axis of rotation to the closer curve, which is the parabola. So this time my outer radius is top minus bottom. So this is my outer radius this time. So it's the top curve. I'll write it again here, which is two X minus six. So it's two X minus six minus the bottom, which is negative three. My inner radius is going, we're going to always do top minus bottom. So the top is the parabola X minus three squared. So the length of this line is X minus three squared is what's on top minus negative three. And you can obviously call that plus three. So the volume obtained by spinning this little shape about this line, we're gonna get something down here like this and it's gonna look like this, right? The volume is pi and we know X goes from three to five. It's going to be the outer radius, two X minus six minus negative three. And you can obviously clean that up squared minus the inner radius x minus three squared minus negative three squared. Don't forget to square, squaring outer and inner radius. All right, what happens if we now start spinning these things vertically? How does it change? Well, this whole concept doesn't change. What's going to change when we start integrating or spinning vertically is we're gonna integrate with respect to y. So we have y equals two x minus six. If I solve this for x, I add six and divide by two, I get x is equal to one half y plus three. And then here, the parabola was, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna run out of room here, y equals x minus three squared right now here, this is where I said it gets really super tricky. Because when I take the square root of both sides, I get x minus three equals the positive or negative square root of y. And then I get, I add three, I get x is equal to three plus or minus the square root of y. So I have just, I have two sides of the parabola here. I have to decide, notice at three, at zero, I'm sorry, when y is zero, we get three for x, that's there, but what side is which of this? So this is where you have to be really careful when you solve for y. What side of the parabola is that? Well, let's pick a value of y. Let's pick like this value right here. When y, when x is five, y is four, right? So we want, we know this goes to the point five, four, right? So if y is four, we get three, plus or minus two. So we're gonna get either five or one. We want the five, so it must be the plus side. So therefore this function is three plus the square root of y. 
equals x. So that's why you have to you have to be really super careful when we take square roots because if we were had the shape over here, we'd have to use three minus the square root of y. So I now have my two functions written in terms x and terms of y. So now I have this shape right here, this area, and I'm spinning it about the line x equals two. So x equals something. So we have here, I have x equals one half y plus three. In my parabola, x is equal to three plus the square root of y. So my, I'm gonna draw from my axis of revolution to the outer curve. So that's gonna be my outer radius. Axis of revolution to my inner curve will be my inner radius. So I have um, outer radius is going to be right minus left. My inner radius will also be right minus left. Oops, sorry, I meant to do that in between. So right, my outer radius, right is going to be is the parabola, one half y plus three minus the left, minus two. All right. My inner radius is going to be, nope, I'd made that mistake, hold on, that, sorry. Outer radius, I, I, I'm looking at the wrong thing. My outer radius right here is my right, which is my parabola, um, or it, which resulted in a square root function. So this is going to be, I'll put it up here, three plus the square root of y is this function right here, three plus the square root of y minus two, where the inner is the one half y plus three minus two. So my volume is going to be pi. Now this time, oops, I didn't do it here, here, this is the point three zero. So now y goes where it's spinning vertically, y goes from zero to four. It's going to be my outer radius squared minus my inner radius squared. And we're integrating with respect to y this time. So no, notice now my axis of revolution was to the left of the shape. How do things change if my axis of revolution moves to the right of the shape? Well, it's always right minus left. So last one, I promise. All right, so this time I'm looking at this shape. I'm spinning with the respect to the line, x equals six. Gotta make those pictures a little bit bigger. X equals six, so remember this is the line. X is equal to one half Y plus three. And then the parabola is X is equal to three plus the square root of Y. And when we switch the variables, the parabola became a square root function. So as always, I draw, I start at my axis of revolution and I go to my outer curve. The longer line is my outer radius. My axis of revolution to the inner curve is my inner radius. So my outer radius is always right, my, we never do left minus uh, right, right minus left. So my outer radius is the longer line. So the right is six minus one half y plus three. I'll make sure if you if you're what you're subtracting is a summary difference that you include the parentheses. My inner radius is right minus left. It's the smaller line. So it's going to be six minus three plus the square root of y, all in parentheses. So my volume is going to be pi, we're going from zero to four. My outer radius squared, six minus one half y plus three. My outer radius squared minus six plus three, oops, sorry. 
sorry, 6 minus 3 plus the square root of y. That's a big old minus there. Squared. Ty. Whew. All right. Lots going on here, guys. These take lots of practice. If you are struggling, please zoom in. We'll go through more problems. Um, once you get the hang of it, it's pretty cool and not all that terrible. So have fun with these. And uh, that's it. I'll talk to you soon.